said amen. Can everybody say, great are you, Lord? Great are you, Lord. Hallelujah. Shake somebody's hand as you're being seated. So glad to see you in the house of the Lord. God is good. Good to see your smiling face. My job this morning is to uh, introduce you to one of the finest ministry couples that I know in the world. And I don't say that lightly. For 24 years, they have pastored an unbelievable church in Cape Town, South Africa. When I was there a few months back, Jeannie and myself, six, seven hundred people bringing chairs in, nowhere to sit. After 24 years, and people are still bringing chairs in. Millions of people being ministered to on a on a weekly basis over the airwaves. God allowed me to be in those radio station uh, offices and meet those folks and preach and share the gospel on those same microphones that He does week after week after week after week. God just opened some unbelievable doors. Birch and myself were in. 15, 18, 20 countries now last year with with Brother Raymond doing what he does and what we do. Unbelievable that God took a ministry from the mountains of East Tennessee and connected them to a, a, a ministry in, in the nation of South Africa. What's really interesting to me that we're many of us came from our forefathers were pioneers. They came here and and uh, settled the the countryside and pioneered and and at the same time that the United States was being birthed because of freedom of, of religion, people from Europe came came west to to North America and most of us are are the grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-greats. At the same time that was happening, there was other people got on ships and they went south. And they ended up at, in, a, in the very tip of Africa, the continent of Africa, 50-something countries. And instead of calling those folks pioneers, they called them four-trackers. And they took this gospel this gospel of the kingdom that that we're taking they took it north and many 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 of them died of malaria many 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 of them died killed at the hands of the, the native people there but they called them four trackers and the reason they call them four trackers is because they got in their wagons just like our folks got in their wagons and went west. They got in their wagons and made four tracks north. And the descendants of those four trackers are still taking this gospel. This gospel of the kingdom that's going to be preached to all ethnos, people groups, and then the end will come. They're helping us. And they've partnered with us in such an unprecedented way. And last year, somewhere in the neighborhood of 12% of all the churches that were planted in the whole world by everybody that calls on the name of Jesus, somewhere in the neighborhood of 12% of all the churches that were planted were planted by our partnership. To me, that's unbelievable that God's allowed us to be a part of that. Huge. The Church of God, Rio Missions, Wheels for God's Word, 
and Harvesters International. Over 40,000 churches have been planted now through this ministry and the and the the way we're doing it. We've got a, a special evangelistic plan. You're going to hear and see more about that. We've got a, a certain discipleship church planning plan. We've got a, a strategy. And God has connected us. Jonathan Sweet and and, and Pastor Tommy and, and Zach Rayburn were in in Chad just a few weeks ago and they they were with a long time friend, Pastor Amani, one of the great leaders in the, the continent of Africa, worked with, with Brother Raymond for years and years. And all these connections just keep on and keep on. And in our connections in in Latin America. Some of you all have been watching Real Missions on Facebook and, and saw that this week Pastor Elias in Rancheria has got has made commitments for 21 new churches in the mountains of Coquille. And they were strategizing with our model, with our discipleship church planning plan, with, with the heart of man chart that you're going to see. You're going to see what we're doing in the nations of the world here today. And I am so glad that you're here and that Raymond and, and Amanda are here. We love you, lovey. <laughs> My South African isn't real good, but they, that, these folks, or at least Raymond is called a booter. It's B-O-E-R. And a, a booter is like somebody from East Tennessee. They're people that make things happen. They're people that roll their sleeves up and get their hands dirty. They're people that, that step into what's going on and they become solutions to the problems. Brother Raymond is, while we've been doing what we've done all these years and he's been going, working with the pygmies in the Congo and, and uh, all kind of crazy places all over the continent of Africa while we have primarily been in in, uh, in India and in, in the Kenya area in Uganda, Sudan. Funny that he was working in Sudan the same time during the Civil War that we were and we never met. It's crazy. We're going we're gonna to receive an offering this morning. You know, if I'm, if I'm going to go to a bank today for a, a retirement account. Number one, I'm going to go to a, a bank that has got a, a steady track record. A, a bank that isn't about to go out of business next week. I'm going to go to a, to a bank that's solid, strong, got a good reputation, been doing what they do for years. I'm going to go to a bank that pays more interest than the average bank. I'm going to go to a to a bank that that I can expect a ROI. Anybody know what ROI is? ROI is return on investment. We got bankers and business people here. And anybody that's investing is looking for a return. When we spend our blood, sweat, and tears going to the nations of the world and take a chance on being bit by something that can make us sick for the rest of our life or eat something that makes us ill or any of the, or maybe look down the, the barrel of an AK-47, which we've done that together. <laughs> The reason I'm doing it is because I'm looking for a return on investment. When you box up food for the hurting here at Isaiah 58, you're looking for a return on investment. We're looking to bless people and help people and see the kingdom expanded. And this morning, you're going to have an opportunity to sow into one of the most powerful ministry partnerships that I've ever seen or been aware of. And I've been in this for a, a day or two. It's unbelievable what God's doing. Ushers, will you go ahead and 
serve the people. And for you guys that hadn't heard this in a long time, Jeannie, write a check. <laughs> for you folks that, that weren't here while I, I was the pastor 16 or 17 years, that, you got to hear that quite often. Jeannie, write a check. <laughs> Sure is good to be home this morning. We're gearing up for a, a big fall and winter. A lot of good things are going on. Matthew 24, 14, this gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached for a witness to all nations, ethnos, and then the end will come. We're, this offering is ushering in the coming of the Lord. You ever thought of it in that, from that standpoint, that light? Hmm. Praise the Lord. Y'all come up. We all stand and help me fertilize these seeds with prayer Father Lord as we stretch our hands forth towards these sacrifices that people have made this morning Lord these seeds Lord I thank you for fertile ground and we we fertilize these seeds with prayer Lord help the gospel to go forth help us to usher in your coming Lord help us to fulfill scripture Lord, as we give sacrificially in, into this harvest. Lord, we're expecting a harvest, a return on investment. Lord, I bless the ministry you've allowed us to be a part of. I bless Raymond Lombard. I bless Amanda. I bless their children, their church. I bless their ministry. Lord, I bless wheels for God's word and harvesters. We bless the ministry that you've allowed us to be a part of. Lord, we bless Stephen Lutz and Hannah Lee. Lord, use us for your glory. We bless Rio Missions. Lord, use us. Lord, increase our ability to do what you've called us to do. Give us a greater return on our investment. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. Brother Raymond. Come and just take your liberty in the Lord. I love you, my brother. I'm not going to hug you because I'm not going to mess up your your mic. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you. Uh, English is my second language. So I grew up speaking Afrikaans. And uh, years ago, the Lord told me, you better learn to speak some English. I didn't like it at all, but then I had to learn to speak some English. And yes, yeah, some of you, your second language is also English. Isn't that true? I found that to be true some places in the States. So I'm very happy to be with you this morning and with my wife. And um, the way I'm going to minister and share with you in a few minutes, I'm going to try and keep it very simple, very short, to the point, and uh, trust the Lord that you will be blessed. Thank you for coming. I'd like you to open your Bible, if you have it, or read it on the screen. If They will put it for us on the screen. And I will read for us in James chapter 1, from verse 21 to verse 27. And while you're doing that, thank you, Brother Tommy, for allowing me and my wife to be in your church this morning. Thank you, Ronnie, for you and Jeannie to have arranged for us. We appreciate it. Let's read together in James chapter 1, from verse 21 to verse 27. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. 
For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. To keep oneself unspotted from the world. Our dear Heavenly Father, Thank you that in the precious name of Jesus we could enter your throne room this morning through praise and worship. What a wonderful, glorious time we had to enter into your presence and to bring our hearts to you, our minds, our thoughts, even our bodies as a living sacrifice. And our Father, as we Come before you, we bow before you, we humble our hearts, and we desire that your word will speak to us from the throne room of heaven, that something of the beauty of heaven will come down and touch our lives, that in a very special way today, our hearts will be turned, will be touched by your presence, that we will have an experience of the presence of Jesus, revealed through the word of God, that we will have an encounter with the living God, that you will challenge us, that you will change our thinking, the way we live, to become more and more like Jesus. That our lives will be in line with your word. We pray that your spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, will inflame our hearts. That you will touch us in such a way that we will be truly disciples of Jesus Christ. That when we enter heaven, that the people in heaven will say, and the angels, look at that man, look at that woman, come walking in by the pearly gates. That is truly a disciple of Jesus Christ, a follower. Lord Jesus, be merciful to us this morning, we pray. Father, we pray that you will be glorified and your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. And we all say, Amen. Now, if I were to challenge you, and I were to ask you, is there anybody here today that dared to come to this church and you did not look in the mirror this morning? Will you lift up your hand? Who of you never looked in the mirror this morning? I believe that not, if not all of us, most of us, would first look in the mirror before we leave home. I mean, at least uh, you go to the bathroom, you clean yourself and, you know, you uh, put some nice things on and, Look in yourself in the mirror, comb your hair and say, okay, good enough, let's go to church. I mean, didn't you do that this morning? Each one of us cleaned ourselves, put our new clothes this morning and says, okay, thank you, Lord, for a good night's rest. 
Today is a new day. And we looked in a mirror. The question today is, is it possible for me in some way to let you have a look at your own heart? Is it possible for me to show you a mirror of your heart? I would love to, if it was possible today, to reveal to you your own heart. Now, working in Africa, working in many nations, in the country of South Africa, that is where we live, uh, we work from there into uh, the continent of Africa, 42 nations, only on the continent of Africa, not, I'm not talking about the east and other parts of the world, only in Africa. So I've been traveling for 21 years, I many times uh, stayed down the barrel of a gun, became very sick, had malaria, food poison, been bitten by many things, nearly drowned, uh, many things happened, but the Lord has been very good to me. But meanwhile, by doing all these things, I always had only one purpose in mind. And that is, how can I challenge my brothers, my fellow disciples? How can I challenge the men and women of God to take the gospel to the unreached people groups on the continent of Africa, deep in the heart of the rainforest? And uh, I know Ronnie sometimes go and we do, and people say, well, you know, they go where angels fear to tread. But I mean, that's what we're called to do. And we have no choice. We have to do it. Uh, we are called by the Lord and we've given our lives for it. And many times my people in local church, they say, Pastor, we love you so much. And we don't want you to go so much. Maybe one day you don't come back. I said, well, then you put on my grave, died in action. I mean, I was at least doing something for the Lord. You know, you walk over the street and a car run you over and you're dead and gone. I said, and I'll be still working for the Lord. I said, you know, let's face it, we're all going to die. I mean, be honest today, the death rate is still one per person and we're all going to make it. Is that true? Well, it's only half the truth. The rapture could take place tomorrow and that will stop it altogether. But that is for the Lord Jesus to decide, not for us. But in my quest... When the Lord called me, sent me into Africa, a vision I received from the Lord. The one thing I knew is, how can I help these men and women of God to take the gospel into a place where nobody has ever heard the name of Jesus? Never heard the words from the lips of a Christian that there's a living God, our Father in heaven, and he has a son, and his name is Jesus, Jesus Christ. And he loved us so much, he died for us on a cross. They never heard. So it took me hundreds and thousands of kilometers on scramblers, dirt bikes, flying until the last airplane dropped us and say, well, we'll see you in two weeks, Pastor, if you come alive out of this rainforest. Then we get on dirt bikes and we will do 1,400, 1,300 kilometers deep in the forest. Later on, there's no more road. There's no way for a dirt bike. You drop it. You get in a boat, um, a hollow trunk, tree trunk. And from there you go deeper. And you see people die. You see people become very sick. You become very thirsty, very challenging. You see snakes. You see all kinds of things. But when you have the love of Jesus in your heart, you want to take the gospel out. There's a burning passion to do what the Lord has called us to do. I still had this problem. How is it possible that you can share the gospel with somebody that cannot read or write? Because you have to remember now, when you go into the darkest parts of the continent of Africa, and I've been everywhere, now, when you go there from the north to the south, the east to the west, to the deserts of Sudan, to the mountains of the Nuba Mountains, uh, to the deepest of the rainforest, Ouagadougou, Monrovia, Sierra Leone, and when you travel Mali and you go to all these places and you know, you never know if you will come back home, you want to make sure that if you give your life for something, it's something good. You are prepared to die for it. Are you prepared to die for what you believe? Are you prepared to give your life for what you believe? 
Have you reached the point where nothing else in life matters so much that you will die for the sake of Jesus because you love him so much? He has done so much for you. Nobody has loved you so much as he did. Nobody's been so good to you, so forgiving, so kind, so lovable, so caring as Jesus. And so what I would do is, when I had my first trip into the heart of Africa, I said, Lord, I don't know where they are, your men and women. I don't know where to find them. And he said to me, you remember when Elijah prayed and said, I'm alone. And the Lord said, you think you're alone? There are 7,000 others that has never bowed their knee before Baal. You go, you find them. And the Lord even gave him a name of one of them, Elijah. So I went, and the rest is history. Today I've trained uh, close to 17,000 men and women of God in their most remote places on earth. One of your great evangelists, Billy Graham, his son Franklin Graham as a pilot, and uh, Mark Leprini and some others, and one of the pilots, when he dropped me in the Nuba Mountains, he says, Pastor Ray, I'll be back in 14 days at this spot where I drop you. And now they fly us undercover so that the Russians, with their entrepreneur, when they come with their airplanes to kill us, that they don't know that we've come in. So we fly from Loki Chalky, which is northern Kenya. They will fly us low undercover with a small DC-3 train or, or uh, a plane or with an 18-seater uh, uh, caravan, a two-prop plane. And then they will drop us and tell us, if all goes well, soon two weeks. 50 degrees Celsius, which would be about 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Is that hot? It's very hot. So I would tell Ryan Boyette, an American, I'll say, Ryan, um, you know, it's very hot today, you know. And I'm walking in the desert 130 kilometers. So, and I'd say, Ryan... And he's American here from the uh, southern uh, area in, in uh, eastern down south uh, in the United States. And I'll say, Ryan, it's very hot today. He says, no, Pastor Ray, it's not so hot. The chickens are still walking. When you see a chicken pass out, you know it's very hot. I say, dear Lord, I don't want to see chickens passing out, you know. But how do you share the gospel? And I'm going to keep it very short to the point. I'm challenging you. I'm asking you. If you were to share the gospel with somebody that cannot read or write, how would you do that? How would you go about? You cannot read from the Bible. They don't know the Bible. They don't know the scriptures. They don't know anything. Never heard of the Bible. Never heard about Jesus. But me and you have grown up and know every day. They've never heard, never seen. Nobody ever taught them a thing. How do you do that? So what I would like to do is, I would like to share with you, in brief, the heart of man-child. It could be the heart of a woman and the heart of man. So I'd like to show you, if it's possible, um, Brother Tommy, can we take this pulpit away from you? And uh, I would just like to ask our friends on the sides, it might, be very, you know, it might be very difficult for you to see what I'm going to show. So if it's a problem, you just need to you know, move a little bit uh, inside. Otherwise, it will be a problem for you. We call this the heart of man chart. Very simple tool that we use. And I've trained now nearly, roughly 17,000 men and women. And we have this available in more than 300 different languages. The booklet explaining it. And uh, Brother Ronnie has been working with me in many, many countries using this. And Birch and some of your people of Rio have been uh, traveling with us and using this. You can hang it in a tree in Africa. You can uh, keep it in your hand. You can have a buddy helping you to hold this chart. But when you look at this chart of the heart of man, what, what comes to mind when you look at this picture? What is the first thing that you are thinking? There's a battle. Can you see it? There's a battle, a spiritual battle for the heart of man. And this spiritual battle that you can see it's between darkness and light. I'd like to show you the first page. This page is the heart of a sinner. 
If you look at these symbols, and we use symbols to explain. Looking at the symbol, you will see there's things outside the heart, and there are things inside the heart of man. When you look what is outside the heart of man, you can see that there's flames here, and that speaks of the love of God, the love of God that's not in the heart of man. The Lord loves him, but his love cannot be poured out in his heart because there are many evil things in the heart of the sinner. And also, the, the dove represent the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit cannot enter the heart of a sinner. Something needs to change. Something needs to happen here before the Holy Spirit will have the liberty of entering his life. And also, the messenger represent the word of God because the word angelos means also messenger. So the word of God, the spirit of God, and the love of God is not in the heart of this man. You can see that the blood of Jesus is also not being applied. So the blood of Jesus, the love of God, the word of God, and the spirit of God is not in the heart of a sinner. Of somebody that's lost, that don't know the Lord. And when you look at his face, you can see he's very perplexed. He's very worried. He's having a battle. Life is hard without the Lord. To not know the Lord is very difficult in life. To make life work for you without the Lord is a terrible thing. To fight alone, to be without the living God, makes it very difficult in life. So you can see he's having all kinds of battles. When you look at this heart, you can see it's darkened by sin. And there's many things that has taken place in his life. And because of our situation, uh, especially in the Africa continent, we can explain by using symbols of different kinds of animals to, uh, to enlighten and enhance and speak about different kinds of sin. Like, for instance, what is this? Do you know what is this? It is a peacock. And a peacock is a very beautiful bird. And the peacock, uh, it's, it, it, it is full of pride, and it will show its beautiful feathers. And so when we speak of the peacock, we speak of the pride of life. We speak of pride in the human heart. When we look at the next symbol and you see the goat, the goat speaks of sexual immorality because of what happens in public. And this can speak of all kinds of different sexual sins in the heart of man. This, of course, is a pig. And the pig, you can clean it, you can wipe it clean, you can wash it, but the moment you release it, it will dive right into the mud, very dirty again. So it speaks of all kinds of dirty things. And in the human heart, what we think and what we do and how we act in life. We do many dirty things. And when you look here and you see the mirror, you might be reminded, like we've just read in the book of James, that by, by looking in the word of God, you're looking into a mirror. And when you see here, you might see certain things that could be applicable in your own life. Looking here, this pig, it will share uh, uh, all kinds of dirty things by eating it, by jumping into it, uh, falling into it, also speaks of gluttony and also of all kind of drunkenness. And this is a tortoise. Now, if you know a tortoise, it's a slow-moving creature. Pole pole is a Swahili, which means slow-moving. Now, we say yes. When it's to come to God, very slow to move. But in the African context, they use the shell of the tortoise for the Grigris and the Voodooism. It is for the spiritual witchcraft. So it also speaks of all kind of contact with evil spirits, the spirits of the forefather, evil spirit, demon spirits, uh, divination, uh, 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 contact with the spirit world, and actually means contact with demon spirits. And when you look at the next one, that is a leopard. Now the leopard is a very vicious animal. In our continent, we have thousands and hundreds of thousands of leopards. Now we know from the nature of a leopard, that is very fast, very cruel, and it will kill for what it wants. So if it wants something, it will grab it, it will jump on it, it will run because it can move with speed. And we speak here when we talk about the leopard, we will say 
it is in the heart of man and heart of man or in the heart of a woman, they can be very uh, uh, high temper. Um, they, uh, they are very short tempered. They get very angry. And also you will see that they will kill. Many people will kill for what they want. They want your car or your house or something that you have. They will come there and they will kill you for what they want. In Africa, we have many genocides. And uh, when you go to Rwanda and Burundi, it's heartbreaking to see when they have killed themselves, more than half a million people in one country. A terrible thing had happened on our continent. And this is a snake. The snake can speak of jealousy, deceit, and all kinds of lies. And that is exactly the devil himself. He lied to Eve. He was jealous about the relationship between Adam and Eve and the living God. And he lied to her and he deceived Eve because he is a great deceiver. This also speaks of the spirit of the devil. This is a, uh, a frog, but very peculiar type of frog. You do find different type of frogs in Africa. Though there's one type of frog that's very interesting. It's a Congo frog. When it gets to an ant hill, it, as long as the ants come out, it will keep on eating the ants. And it will not stop. And you must remember, there can be hundreds of thousands of ants under the ground. So as they're coming, the frog sits there and he eat them and he eat them and he eat them and he eat them and he grows, grows, and he grows. Like, like people that go to, uh, what's that place again? Uh, Golden Coral, you know? <laughs> grows and grows, you know? Uh, sorry, forgive me. I mean, I shouldn't say that. But anyway, so what it does is it sits there and it eats and it eats and it doesn't know when to say no. It cannot say no. It doesn't know when to stop. And eventually, pah, and it dies right there. We say, huh, that makes us think that this creature cannot say no. Always wants more. Do you know people like that? doesn't matter what you give them, they want more. You give them a car, tomorrow they want a better one. They live here, they want to live in a better place. You give them clothes, they want more. Cannot say no. Always want. So we say this speaks of the things of the world. Worldly things. The, the, the things that the eyes see, that the heart desires and the flesh. And so this man, his heart is grabbed. By all these things in the world. And God's eye, God can see everything. You know, the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at Eliab because man sees the countenance of another man. But I, the Lord God, I see the heart. You know, there's somebody today, someone that can see your heart and understands everything in your heart. And so God can see through the spirit of God in each one of our hearts. And this man's conscience is darkened by sin. The star represents and speaks of his conscience. And the devil, he says, ah, this is my heart. This heart belongs to me. And you can just imagine dying in a way like that, what will happen? So if this is the state of a human being's heart, and let me tell you something else. Every person that is lost, every sinner, this is part of his life. But something has happened. Look what happened. He heard a message. He heard Hebrew 9 verse 27. In your Bible, in Hebrew 9 verse 27, it is written, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. And he realizes, I'm going to die. And he heard the message because the word that has reached him the word of God, the two-edged sword, Hebrew 4 verse 12, that cuts like a two-edged sword. He heard the word of God. He know that he's going to die, but he realizes he needs Jesus. Because now, when the, the moment when he hears about Jesus and the forgiveness of Jesus, and that Jesus died for his sin on the cross, and he opened his heart. If you open your heart to the word of God, the Holy Spirit will immediately... Come with power and enlighten your heart. The moment that you open your heart to the Lord, every time you open your heart to God, the Holy Spirit comes with convicting power into our lives. And so the Holy Spirit is busy witnessing to him. And you can see what is happening. Evil has to flee because now he is confessing his sin. He's asking God's forgiveness. And if you do that with all your heart, you can see what has happened. His heart has now changed because what has happened here, he accepted the word of God, the cross of Jesus. 
He heard about Jesus dying for him, giving his life for him. And because he accepted it, you can see what happened. The feet of the messenger has gone into the heart. So if you accept Jesus that died for you on the cross, what happens is the word of the cross come into your life. It changes your heart forever. Can you see what has happened here? The love of God, the Father, has entered his life. The blood of Jesus has cleaned his heart. And now you can see the Holy Spirit lives inside of him. And the light of God, eternal life, his life has changed. This is the life of a man and a woman of God that's been born again. He has come to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And you can see what has happened now. All evil is outside, but you can see there's still a battle. Even if you give your life to Jesus, you will always have a spiritual battle because of our sinful nature that we have until we die. So there will always be a battle. And now this man, because of the change in his life, you can see now wonderful things has happened. The Holy Spirit lives inside him. The joy of the Lord is part of his life. And now he even lives himself a life of self uh, uh, sacrifice because Jesus sacrificed his life. He understood that Jesus wear a crown of thorns. He understood that Jesus betrayed, was betrayed by his own friends, by Judas. Even Peter denied him. He understand that they even took the clothes of Jesus and they gambled. But Jesus loved us so much that he gave his life. And because of that, Jesus has become now his Lord and Savior. And when that happens with you, your heart has changed. Look what has happened with him. The heart is now a place of worship. Like when Pastor Tommy and the leadership and everybody here on stage were leading us today to worship the living God. Because now every place I go, I can worship the Lord. I can worship in my car, in church, at home, wherever I travel. My heart is a place of worship. My heart is a place where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is worship. And his conscience is clear. And you can see all that symbols is gone. Now you see the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 22. Love, hope, faith, and all these wonderful things that the Christian have in his life. And you can see that the devil is still there. So the battle never stops. Our problem in our society in America today, I think is not what I've just shown you. I think many times the problem is more here. I think this is a problem. Can you see what has happened here? Can I explain to you? Have a closer look. This man, his heart is divided. Look here. He professes the cross. He knows something about Christianity. But you can see there's many things in his heart that shouldn't be there. The fault of the world, the pig. The things of the world, the frog and the snake and, and the words of people that cut like a knife. And you can see sexual immorality. Oh yes, this nominal Christendom. We go to church. We say we love the Lord. We know something about Jesus. But you can see there's many other things in his heart. He never confessed these things. So the danger is to know something about Christianity and not accept it with all your heart, then it means you live a double life. And because of this, when the end comes, it will be terrible. Look at this. This man, he did not confess his sins. And the Bible says, eventually what happens is the flesh, the sins of the flesh, become stronghold for demon powers. So what's actually happening is, the devil gets you in his grip. If you don't confess and break with what is wrong, the devil gets a foothold in your life. And slowly but surely, he will erode on that road. And bit by bit, he cuts into your life. And you think it's not so bad, you know. I'm just doing this little thing and, you know, everybody does it and it is okay. But it's not okay. It doesn't and it shouldn't be uh, and, uh, in, a, in a heart of the child of God. And he allowed things. But what happens now, eventually, the works of the flesh and the sinful deeds of the human heart is taking over his heart. And you know what's going to happen? He will die without Jesus. It's terrible. 
You cannot change this ever. Death has come. Because he said no to the truth of the word of God. He said no to Jesus. He would never, ever break with all his sins and say, Lord Jesus, I give you all my heart. I give you every area and sphere of my life. I commit my total life into your hands. Some of us want to give the Lord part of our heart. Eventually what will happen, we will die. And we need to make sure that we've truly given our whole life to the Lord. Now death has come. You can see the fear on his face. He's sick. He's on his deathbed. And he's a scared man. And we know eventually he will end up in the flames of hell. And the demons are waiting there for him. And all evil, fallen angels, demon spirits, all of them will eventually end up with him in the flames of hell. This is the end of a sinner. A person who dies without Jesus Christ. But not so with a true Christian. I want you to look at this. This is a wonderful picture of a man of God that has the joy of the Lord. He has the love of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. His life has been totally changed. This is truly a life of a victorious Christian. This is supposed to be me and your life. Have a look at it. You can see he lives a straight life. If you want to see how he lives, he lives a straight life. Look at this. From his face, his conscience is clear because of the blood of Jesus washed away all sin. And he loves Jesus. He lives a life of self-sacrifice. He builds his life on the foundation of the word of God. He shares his money like what you've done this morning. I read in the Bible that Martha and Maria and many other women, the Bible says in Luke, they all serve the Lord Jesus with their belongings, with what they have. Do you serve the Lord with what you have? They serve the Lord with what they have. And, they, and, he, and, and he fights a spiritual fight. And you can see he shares his food. He goes to the house of the Lord. And although other people want to invite him to come and share in worldly things, his answer is no. And in closing, I want you to look at this. We know that the Christian will also die, but the difference is going home. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's going home. The moment the Christian dies, spirit leaves his body. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 16 that the angels took Lazarus to the bosom of Abraham. So we know that when we as Christians die, we will go to meet the Lord. We will go to paradise. Our names is in the book of life. And we will be clothed with new robes, with white robes. And we have our names written on precious stones. This is where we're going. Knowing that when my end comes, I will be with the Lord Jesus. And so tomorrow, uh, uh, so this morning, when you look at this, are you ready for this? I know there's some people in this world today, and I don't know if there's anybody in this room, but if you die today, is this going to be the story of your life? Or will this be a story of your life? Which one will be the story? And so it's very challenging to hear from the Lord today that our hearts need to be clean. I heard Pastor Ronnie said this morning, get away from the horizontal and get in line with the vertical. And this is what it's all about, is our lives need to be right with the living God. Doesn't matter what people say on the horizontal level of this life. Doesn't matter what they do. But for me, it's about my relationship with Him. And if I want my relationship with Him to be good, to be intact, I need to have a clean heart. So my heart cannot be like this. Now, in closing, I would like to ask you something this morning. When you look at this, now you can understand that in the bush, in the forest of Africa, never heard of Jesus. And they shared this gospel with people, how Jesus died. And they spent time with him, how it touches people's lives. How many thousands have come to the Lord Jesus. Maybe perhaps this morning, when I was sharing with you, you look at your own heart and you realize, you know, maybe this, I don't always speak the truth. Or there's things that's not supposed to be there in my heart. I can't think of a better time to be in church to say, Lord, please forgive me. If there's anything that does not bring any honor to you today, I want to leave it. I want to break with it. 
You know what would be wonderful for me? If in a few minutes we can leave this building and nothing, nothing, nothing that's not honoring to God leave with us. We let the blood of Jesus wash us away. All things does not honor the Lord. Can we pray together? Please bow your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you just as I am. You know my heart. You know the desires of my heart. And when I look at these pictures, I can clearly see what the message is behind the words and behind the pictures. I understand. I understand this morning my heart needs to be pure, washed by the blood of the Lamb, filled with the Holy Spirit, having my name written in the book of life, washed by the blood of Jesus, living a victorious life, fighting the good spiritual fight of Ephesians chapter 6, knowing that I belong to the Lord, ready to fight for my King, my Lord and my Savior. But I know it's only true if I have confessed my sins. Your word says, if we confess our sins, He will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Dear Lord Jesus, we love you so much. Thank you for giving your life for me, for us. While we sit and our heads bowed in prayer, if the Lord has spoken to you, to your heart this morning, while you sit there, will you just lift up your hand? Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I see so many hands. Anybody else? Has the Lord spoken to you this morning? You saw something? Let me ask you, what and where? What did the Lord say? And where did He lay His finger on? He says something that shouldn't be there anymore. And He wants you to confess it. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front this morning but I would ask you like myself to stand before the Lord and say Lord I heard what you said and today I confess forgive me Lord forgive me my pride forgive me for my lies whatever it might be that the Lord has put his finger on this morning in your life Will you just stand with me and I can pray with you? Just where you are. Don't need to come out. I want you just to stand and say, Lord, today I want my heart to be washed pure by the blood of Jesus. Thank you for standing. Is there anybody else? Before we close, you know what the Lord said to you. You want to stand? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the young people standing. Is there anybody else? Before I pray for the last time, one more time, I'm going to ask if there's anybody else who would like me to pray for you. I want you to stand up right now. Let's just pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the power of your word, Lord. Thank you that you spoke to me this morning and that I could open my heart Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Lord Jesus, and wash my heart. Cleanse me, Lord. Change my life. Make me new, Lord. Wash me with the blood of Jesus. That I can be sure that my name is written in the book of life. 
Thank you that you loved me so much, that you cared so much, that you gave yourself for me. I do not deserve it, Lord. But now I accept your forgiveness and that I can go away today knowing that you have changed my heart. You have touched my life. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for Jesus Christ. And we all say, Amen. Thank you so much. You can take your seats. Thank you, Pastor.